Welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast. This is episode number 56. I'm Ramon Mejia, here to bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course, author interviews. And this week I have uh, eight new Lit RPG stories to review with you this week. Uh, we'll be reviewing, uh, first, The Monster Spawn, a Lit RPG series, Adonis Rebirth, book one. Uh, after that, it'll be Ripcord Online. Then after that, it'll be Raiding Jotunheim, a Lit RPG saga. It's the second book in the Valhalla Online series uh, after that it'll be nemesis online and then it will be fragged which is a lit rpg short story series this will be book one in that series after that it'll be restoration and the rise of resurgence book two after that it'll be Ephilia, the soul of araga a lit rpg adventure and then after that it'll be a healer's gift adventures of adventures of rad book one there we go all eight titles uh, we're going to move on to Lit RPG News. And in Lit RPG News, we're beginning with Arthur Stone's latest book, The Slave in the Locked Land. Somebody actually uh, recently asked online when the next book in the Weirdest Noob series was coming out. And it just happened to come out this week and being posted on Amazon as a pre-order. It's going to be called, again, A Slave in the Locked Lands. It'll be out on July 31st. We'll have a link in the show notes if you want to go pre-order that. Okay, also, the English cover for G.A. Achilles' fifth book in the Realm of Archon series has been released. Uh, the novel will be titled The Long Road to Karn. It should be featuring the normal main character in that series. Um, and it should be up for pre-order, apparently, by the end of the month. So there you go. Uh, in other cover art news, um, J.B. Garner and J.A. Sapiano have released new cover art for their novel, The Ring of Promise. It looks very, very pretty. Uh, Alaron Kong has also revealed the cover art for his upcoming book, The Land, Predators, uh, the seventh book in the Chaos Seed series, and apparently, according to the cover art, the story is to die for. Yeah, I know. Okay. Uh, also, um, Edward Castle, author of the Unbound Death Lord novel series, uh, has announced this week that he's f- finished the first draft of the second book in the series. Um, I'm not sure if the title is correctly spelled, but it apparently is Obliterarian, uh, but it's complete. Um, you can actually read it on his Patreon account if you want to go check that out. Um, otherwise, we'll all just wait until he's finished editing and read it when he posts on Amazon. And let's see, that's it for Lit RPG news. Uh, we're going to run to the few Lit RPG books that came out this week for audiobook selections, um, including Delver's LOC, Obligations Occurred. That's the second book in that series. Out on audiobook, um, narrated by Jeff Hayes, does a wonderful job. Also, The Land Forging, Chaos Seeds Book 2 is also out on audiobook. That one is narrated by Nick Podell. And finally, uh, Dominion of Blades, uh, written by Matt Dineman, uh, narrated by Andrea Parsnew. Also out on Audible, so if you want to go check those out, I'm sure they'll appreciate it. But always go um, listen to the samples. Narrators are very subjective experience not everybody likes the same voices or the same quality so go look at samples for yourself uh, all those books i can say i have read and i enjoyed all of them okay uh these stories have come out this week but didn't have a chance to review them or reviewing them next week and that includes avarice a lit rpg virtual fantasy adventure and uh, hatchling a were net book one uh, also gamer guy a lit rpg novel also wolves of the lost city a lit rpg novel in the Adventure Online Book 2. Um, the first book in that series, actually, I remember reviewing and I did, didn't consider it a RPG um, for a variety of reasons. You can read the review on that. Um, but I'm happy to give the second book a try as well. So be interested to see if this book is different from the first one. Um, and lastly, this one came out this week as well. Uh, Unwritten Rules, a lit RPG novel, Genesis Online Book 1. Okay, um, I'm going to read off the... Little RPG titles coming up uh, for the rest of June and all July, uh, including on June 27th, uh, Overpowered, a little RPG thriller, forming the company Alpha World Book 2, which will also come out on June 27th. I'll be actually interviewing uh, the author of that series uh, on Monday, and we'll have it out on Tuesday by the time the actual novel comes out. Uh, then also on June 29th, it'll be The Quest, Dark Paladin Book 2. On the 30th, it's going to be Speedrunner, Tower of Babel Book 1. On July the 1st, it'll be Hero of Not. On July the 4th, it'll be Winds of Fate, Feral Book 3. On the 6th of July, it'll be The Curse of Rion Castle, 
Uh, that's book two in that series. On the 11th of July, it'll be Vengeance over Vanaheim, which is going to be the third book in the Bahala online series. That's right. He put one out this month and another one next month. Uh, on the 12th of July, it'll be Codename Freedom, Survive Week 1. Uh, I already know I like that one. Read it on the, on the Royal Road. Also on the July the 14th, it'll be The First Planet, The Space Masters. On the 15th of July, The Kingdom Level 3. On the 28th of July, it'll be Stratus Online, Awakenings. And on July the 31st, it'll be A Slave in the Locklands, the one we just talked about. That's book two in the Weirdest Noob series. And there you go. And sometime in July, I believe Alaron Kong also said that he is going to try to release that seventh book um, in the Chaos 8 series. But he's given no official date, so it's nowhere on the list anywhere. But just letting you guys know. Um, there are, of course, more stories that are coming up in August. Uh, you can look at the full list of upcoming LittleBG either on uh, keepasspodcast.com in the review section um, or at uh, the LittleBG Podcast Facebook page. They'll both be there. On to uh, new releases and reviews. And in new releases and reviews, we begin with The Monster Spawn, a little RPG series, Adonis Rebirth, book one, written by Descartes Davis. Okay, this one is uh, 243 pages, that is 99 cents, that is available on Canola, but uh, price-wise, very nice, I gotta say. Um, the page count might be a little bit off, but it's still pretty good price for, for, you know, for the page count. Um, I'll re read my description of it. It's slightly shorter than the author's. Uh, Nathan is a soldier that dies and has his mind uploaded into Adonis Rebirth. When he gets in the game world, he finds himself not at the starter town he was promised, but in a cave with a goblin minion that obeys his every order. Not only does he find that he can't leave the mountain, but that instead he's not only he's not a normal player, but rather a monster. Turns out the game company made him the boss for a rare quest, and now he has players coming to try and kill him. So there you go. That's my, that's my description of the novel in a nutshell. Um, the premise of the show is actually really interesting. Uh, the fact that a player is, this is a good, kind of an after, af, digital afterlife story. And the player dies and his brain is uploaded to uh, a, a game that he's not exactly sure what's going to happen in there. Um, which is always kind of a weird premise. Why would you sign up for a game that you don't know what it's about? Um, but the author does a very decent job of explaining why somebody would do this. Um, but again, the interesting twist on this is that the player is not loaded as a hero or a, a regular player, but rather as a monster. Um, and he doesn't know that if he dies, he might be digitally deleted forever. It's, it's a weird thing that the, I'm not sure why the game company would do it, but it does have its foundations in actual games in the real world. It really reminded me of a game called Evolve, which is a, a, a cooperative shooter game that's currently out in which, um, like I believe it's three or four of the players play as regular shooter heroes. Um, the fifth player is the monster. And so he can actually evolve and change and spawn off other creatures and these different abilities. Uh, and it's, it, it's a, it's a versus player, but it's also cooperative in that half the team is the good guys, half the, the other guy is the bad guy. And so there is, there's precedence for this kind of story. Um, and I like that this was different in that respect. Um, now the first 40% of the story is a little slow. Um, it, about 40% of it, the first 40% is really just the main character understanding and it being slowly revealed to him that he's not human, that he's actually a monster character, and that he's basically a dungeon master. Um, and there's a bunch of game mechanics that are slowly revealed. Like he can upgrade himself, his minions, he can build traps, he can change the layout of the, the actual dungeon itself. And all those are very cool and interesting. But again, it does take a little bit to kind of get that reveal. Um, so it's a slow build. Um, and I liked those mechanics, especially, uh, they were very interesting. It kind of sets the story apart from, from other just general fantasy stories. Um, and I also like the game mechanic in which the main character has to kind of be choosy about what he does. He can't just kill indiscriminately. He has to be kind of a thinking monster because if he does kill other players, he apparently, um, increases his insanity level. So there's a little crafty and, you know, nod in there, um, but if he increases it to 100%, he'll basically lose control of himself as, as a player and as a human. He'll lose his humanity and he'll become a full-on monster, apparently, um, which is bad, I guess. Um, but I do like that mechanic in that his consequences do have actions. And he, so he has to think of different ways of defending himself as the players come and try to kill him. And, of course, all the dungeon stuff is cool as well. Um, now, unfortunately, a lot of this is kind of spoiled by the end of the story. Um, the end is... It's kind of disappointing, and it kind of took away a, a point for me um, in that the game mechanics 
and all the unique stuff that you just talked about are kind of thrown out the window. And the story leaves the reader on a big cliffhanger. Um, but he definitely throws out all those dungeon master aspects and, and parts of it, at least. Um, and a lot of the reviews kind of reflect this similar points of view in that they, their complaints about issues and formatting, which I kind of overlook. It's not a big deal to me. But also that there's a lot of wasted story potential um, because of what happens at the end of the story. So um, just be aware of that. I agree with that particular criticism and that there's that a lot of that potential in the story was just kind of thrown away and wasted at the end. I don't know what's going to happen in book two. Maybe it'll all come around again. I don't know. Um, but it could, kind of took it down a level of enjoyment um, from from what I had previously experienced by the end of the story, unfortunately. So for me, it gets a score of a 6 out of 10. Okay, on to Ripcord Online, a little RPG series, book one, written by Brian Simmons. Okay, uh, this one is 262 pages. It is $2.99 since it is available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, now, full disclosure, I received a copy from the author for review, but purchased it once it was released. Okay, um, in the story, um, this is another afterlife digital story. Um, there's a technology available that allows people to have their minds uploaded to a game after their after their deaths uh, into an MMO. Now, um, Cal, who's the main character, his wife died two years ago and he could, was never able to get over the loss. So he commits suicide and he follows her into the game that she was uploaded into. Now he'll cross the game world and face any enemy to find his wife again. So that's my description of it in a nutshell. Okay. Um, this story is, there are some good things about it and there's sort of things that kind of sh ask the reader to stretch the bounds of believability in their mind. And with any kind of little bit of story, fantasy story, or science fiction, there's general a, generally a, a, a certain degree of a suspension of disbelief in that you have to kind of accept some fundamental um, things that, things that are true in the story. But, there's always a point in which your mind's going to go, look, that, that goes too far. There's no way some game designer will let this happen. And this happened to me a lot when I was reading this story. Um, first of all, the, the basic premise of the story is super familiar to me. Um, if you've ever read, seen the movie What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams, where he travels through literally heaven and hell to find his wife, that's kind of the same premise that is in, in this story. So it feels very familiar. Um, and this almost feels like a novelized version of that story, um, except that, he, instead of going to heaven and hell, he's in this digital afterlife. Um, and so that creates some very interesting storytelling opportunities, but it also resonates more with fantasy than it does with a lit RPG game world, which is unfortunate. Um, and you can see this when you're reading the story a lot. Um, the story is supposed to be set in MMO RPG, but the world itself feels very much more like a traditional fantasy world with some RGB RPG aspects um, kind of imposed on them, mostly for the main character and its progression of power. Um, and again, most of the RPG stuff is limited to the main character and his progression of power. He gains levels when he kills monsters. He gains new powers, skills, um, that kind of stuff. And so his his progression of power is very RPG centric, which is why this is still a RPG, even if the rest of the world feels very fantasy oriented. Um, and and that world very much does so. It feels like it's a fantasy world where it's under siege from like a new malevolent force. Um, and a lot of the things that occur within this game really don't make sense in, in, in the respect that no sane game company would put these aspects or these mechanics in the story. For example, things like um, drug addiction, um, the option for one player to corrupt and use the rest as a puppet, or uh, permadeath, or player slavery, or child murder. All these things occur within the story um, and the reader is just supposed to accept that a game company not only allows them to happen, but actually program their possibility into the game. Now, I mean, in, in some respects, in, and in some little bit stories, this, this stuff happens. But it's also part of um, players understanding that that's a feature of the game and voluntarily signing up for it. And in this case, all these aspects, all these things, these things that are talked about, are very new to any player that, that dies and is reborn into this world all these things all these you know really bad things everyone's like i never knew this was going to happen and it's a big surprise and everyone's real super depressed that their afterlife isn't as nice as they you know thought it was going to be um and so in that respect it just it kind of stretched the bounds of you know of understanding and like an acceptance that this would be a real video game which, which for me again places in, in more in the realm of 
a fantasy world than just a, a game world. Um, uh, also, let's see. Um, some things that I really enjoyed about the story were the RPG character path of the main character, Kale. He chooses the path of the green mage, and i just getting Kale, green mage, plant mage. Got it. Okay. Um, which to most people apparently seems like it's the weakest character class um, because it's really more non comment oriented, especially in the beginning of the, of the, of the character traits. And it's about growing plants, which is not very comment centric. However, like any good RPG, uh, the main character uses his, his, these abilities intelligently and progresses. And as it progresses, the, the character traits become more powerful that he upgrades his skills and they can do more things. He, can grab a variety of plants to grow them and he becomes a, a super powerful class, which I liked, of course. I always like that, you know, power progression storyline, which is really nice. But but again, I want to reiterate, that's kind of the extent of most of the RPG stuff. Like there are still health bars occasionally and comment notifications, but they're sparse. Most of the RPG stuff is centered around Kale and his class progression. Um, and let's see, um, combat. Unfortunately, combat in the story is kind of mediocre. Um, there are some fights and some of them are you know, large, but none of them were particularly memorable or thrilling. The comment in the story is, is not its key feature. It's mostly the big storyline is going to be Kale searching for his wife, going through all these different lands, meeting these people, helping them out, and eventually them all helping him find his wife towards the very end, of course. Um, additionally, the th a big thing that just kind of drew me out of, like, this can't be a game, is the drug addiction. Um, there's apparently a... a, a a plant called light. Then when people chew it, it makes them relive their happiest memories, which is a, which is an interesting drug in itself. And for a fantasy or like a sci-fi story, it makes sense that it would be real and people would take advantage of it. But the fact that it would have to be programmed into an MMO, that seems less believable to me, unfortunately. And it's, it's kind of a big part of the storyline. Um, also, let's see, um, again, again, most of the story is centered around Cole and a search for a wife, which is, again, not a bad story premise. It's just... It feels super familiar because I've seen that movie, and this is almost a note-for-note um, reflection of that larger storyline. Um, by the end, the story is, is a little predictable, the ending, but it, you know it's still a very cute, happy-ish ending. I won't spoil it for you guys. Um, and it also leaves the opportunity for more storytelling, maybe in a second book. But at the same time, it's at least satisfying enough that you won't pine away for a sequel if it never comes. So um, overall... It's an okay story. It's not bad. It's not amazing. Um, I personally like the power progression points of, of Kale's growth in his green mage power. Um, I thought that was pretty really cool. The intelligent way he used his, his skills and abilities was very nice. But again, the novel overall feels like a fantasy novel take on that movie What Dreams May Come with a little gamification. Um, and that's unfortunate. Uh, for me, that made it just not as satisfying as I had hoping it would be. It gets a score of a 5 out of 10. Okay, on to Raiding Jotunheim, a lit RPG saga, Valhalla Online Book 2, uh, written by Kevin McLaughlin. Okay, uh, this is uh, 221 pages, $2.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, this story is set a few weeks after the end of book one. Samantha has finally earned enough points to move on to the next realm in the game. Unfortunately, someone doesn't want her to progress any further in her quest to talk to the outside world and figure out how she ended up in this virtual afterlife. Another one I know. Um, someone has hired a black-clad assassin to permanently delete her from the game servers. Now she not only has to be concerned with learning the new rules of that new realm uh, and the game plan of Jotunheim, but this assassin too. So there you go. That's my little um, summary of it in a nutshell. Okay, uh, this one is, it's interesting. I had a good time. It, the, the big scheme of it is not really that different from the first book. Um, remember, some things you have to remember in, going into the, in the novel is that Samantha is not voluntarily. She kind of woke up in book one and her mind was uploaded to essentially this digital afterlife, uh, Valhalla Online. And her big goal for the entire series is to um, travel through all the realms, get to that eighth realm and contact the outside world. That's the only way that these players in this world have a chance to talk to the outside. It's very much designed as a, as a closed system where the outside world cannot influence the inside world and the inside world cannot disturb the living in the outside real world. Okay, um, and each realm, of course, has its own gameplay rules. So 
the realm in book one is going to be different from the realm in book two, book three, four, five, six, seven, eight, et cetera. Uh, so each world kind of has a unique opportunity to um, give new gameplay mechanics, make itself different from the other realms, um, but that also changes the rules and expectations for every novel. Um, in the first book, it was very much player versus player oriented, um, capture of the castle kind of stuff. In book two, the realm is Jotunheim, and it's a player versus environment game system where the players aren't, aren't, aren't actually allowed to harm each other. Instead, they go on raids and they capture, um, they fight against giants and they get raid content, good gear. And it's very much um, centered around um, player guilds and getting enough people to like do these really hard, super difficult raid stuff. Okay, um, and again, if you're expecting like a basic formula difference between book one and book two, you're going to be disappointed, but it's not a bad thing necessarily. Uh, book two follows the basics, basics formula of book one. The main character lands in a new realm, not understanding how things work. Everything around her is vastly more powerful than she is. Um, she kind of gets let her run by her nose a little bit in having everything explained to her and other characters trying to level her up. Um, but she's very much a follower in the first half of the book. Then she undergoes a solo experience where she travels by herself, gains confidence, a bunch of levels, gameplay skills, powers, and then she leads her side to her victory against the jerks who are being mean to her in the first half of the book, um, even after a predictable betrayal. That's what happened in the first book, and that happens again in the second book. But again, it's not necessarily bad. It, it is There's enough of a difference there that it feels different, but fundamentally it's kind of the same story. What makes this story different, of course, is the gameplay mechanics. Um, in book one, again, capture the castle, player versus player self, um, which is very different from player versus environment, where it's cooperative gameplay that's required, and you can't actually harm play other players at all. Uh, the focus is, is different. Um, and the explanation of these new game mechanics is enough that it makes the story still interesting. But for me, again, that the part that I liked the best was when the player, um, Samantha, was just on her own leveling up, doing new things uh, about gameplay and, and how to maximize her skills and playing intelligently versus just playing like everyone else. Um, and that still happens in this particular book as well. So it, it was an enjoyable experience for me. Either way, um, the assassin thing in the story, not that important. Um, I think it's going to be bigger in book three uh, because once she goes into Jotunheim, um, the assassin can't kill her. Um, and so, so I, I think that's going to be a much bigger thing in book two in sorry in book three rather than it is book two it's only a minor minor you know plot point um and later on it becomes kind of a i can't but that the uh, who is revealed to be the assassin in black is not a huge surprise like they give you plenty of hints you know before it happens um but overall good read um combat is really nice well described the monsters thought are varied in in the raid content um the guild on guild competition felt a little bit forced, but again, I understand that the player needs motivation to progress very rapidly. Um, and again, the assassin thing is a little bit silly, but I'm hoping that it's going to make more sense in book three overall. Enjoyable read. Gets a score of 7 out of 10. Okay, on to Nemesis Online. Um, this is the full title. Nemesis Online, God Game Royale Series, Game World, Sci-Fi Dystopian, Fantasy Online, Little RPG. Um, and that super long title with all those tags should kind of give you an indication of what kind of story this might be. Um, it is written by, let me see, I wrote it down, Kyle Fox. It is 28 pages. It is $2.99. That's right. And it is not available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, and apparently, I like you guys who are watching this show enough that I accidentally bought it twice. Uh, because it's actually not just under this tag, but it's also uh, for the same author under an entirely different um, end tag series. Um, so it's a little fishy to me, but I read it for you guys and I made sure that it is what it is. Um, and the author, Kyle Fox, has actually dropped a lot of uh, several short stories on Amazon recently, and they're all about the same price tag. They're about 10 cents per page. So if it's 28 pages, it's like $2.99. Anything like 40 pages is like $4 um, long on Amazon, and none of them are on Kindle Limited. So they're just, just based on the price alone, these are not worth it. Um, additionally, uh, this story is not lit RPG. Uh, it might be the first book in a longer series, but this particular one, which is the very first one in this particular series is not lit RPG. Uh, there are some references that there's a game people play in this world and that there are ranks possibly, but there's no actual gameplay in this short story. Again, it's only 28 pages, so you can't expect too much depth. Um, this story focuses mostly on high school drama, teenage flirting, a tiny bit of world building, which has potential. Um, but again, the, the page count cost is just so out 
uh, out there that it was hard for me to really enjoy even that min- kind of mediocre uh, mediocre storytelling unfortunately um it gets a score of three out of ten for me there you go okay uh it is next fragged fragged a literary short story series book one written by zachariah draculius uh, this one is 59 pages, also a short story, but it is priced at 99 cents, much more reasonable. It is also available on Kindle Unlimited. Okay, I'll read you the author's description. Uh, a lit RPG story with crafting, nudity, gratuitous violence, dinosaurs, and profanity. What more could you want? Zoe has been screwed over by someone in her clan, a, sc- a-, a screwing over that has resulted in her getting hit with a permanent and having to restart from scratch in the dystopian game world of Thren. A land of dinosaurs, rabid humans, and more than a few other deadly threats. After what happens, Zoe doesn't know if she can trust anyone in the game again, let alone her clan members, and makes the decision that she's going to go to loan for this foreseeable future. Um, this is a very short story again. Um, and besides, the there's a little bit of a rant in the first 5% of the novel that seems weird, but other than that, it's a really enjoyable short story. Um, the main character is kind of angry throughout the entire novel, but again, it's it's a very interesting experiment from the author um, of, of, of combining a lot of different game mechanics in different settings. Um, it's a sandbox action survival MMO. There aren't any levels, but there are skills that have to be practiced to increase them. And it kind of reminds me of a cross between DayZ and Conan Exiles uh, in those survival mechanics and that old school dinosaur stuff and also futuristic modern weapons as well, all combined in the same kind of world. Um, and again, uh, this the novel starts out with the main character again, very angry that she's had to start a whole new character because permadeath is part of the game and she died by betrayal apparently. It's not really described any more than that. Um, she has to punch a tree to get some wood, breaks a rock, makes her first weapon, stone axe, so there's crafting in there. Um, and then she goes on to build a community by kidnapping some natives and force feeding them, making them a kind of slave. Uh, so she can, so there's even a little bit of community building. Um, and then of course there's some weird crates that drop occasionally that have like really awesome weapons and supplies and that everybody finds over. So there's some, um, competition for resources with other players and there's even dinosaurs. There's a ton of cursing, um, smart ass game notifications, accidental pregnancy, not of the player, but of her slave is, um, and some old friends that arrive towards the end of the story, and then it kind of ends. Um, again, the author describes this as an experimental serial story uh, that he's not sure where it's actually going to go, but it's definitely an RPG. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to go along for the ride. Um, so I hope there's it's going to be a really fun trip. I had a good time reading it. It gets a score of 7 out of 10. Okay, on to Restoration, Rise of the Resurgence, book 2, written by Joshua W. Nelson. This was uh, quite a pleasant read. It is uh, 484 pages, quite a good page count. Uh, For $3.99, it is available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, Now, in the first book in the series, we're actually introduced to a team of beta players um, testing the greatest virtual reality MMO ever uh, called Resurgence. Uh, Our hero, Alex, is recruited by an AI entity in the game to search for some code that may be harming players and their minds. Um, He's given a boost to some of his stats, specifically his chance skill, and I'm uh, sorry, chance stat, and it's given some slightly overpowered gear to help him accomplish his goals. Additionally, he's given access to some unique thief abilities that'll let him harness the powers of Shadow. Alex teams up with a quirky group of other players, Dan, Wayne, and Jason, and together they go off on some amazing adventures in the first book. Um, now, one of the criticisms I have of the first book is that it took such a long time to get to the game world, um, like seriously, about seven chapters, um, and this book definitely fixes that problem like within the first couple percentages of the novel bam in the game world and you stay there about 90 percent of the time so that was a big improvement for me um in the real world um there are there's the like the other 10 percent is real world stuff um the game company alcon is under a secret investigation by the by the government over their tech's ability to possibly mind control players in resurgence so there you go and in book two the storyline is basically the same um, Alex is still searching for that code. He can't tell his group about his interest in finding it. Um, so that's a secret he's keeping from them. At the same time, Altcon is refining its ability to influence the players in the game. And the government is still investigating them. That's kind of it. The big, the, most of the story content is going to be about Alex and his friends going on adventures, getting new gear, leveling up, getting new skills. And there's a really significant portion of it dedicated to Alex just training and grinding out skills um, as a thief. He gets some really cool skills in the story um but again 
the ultimate question, will Alex discover the secrets of Vaultcon? The answer is no, uh, but that's okay. This is not a two book series. It's going to be longer. So I expect that storyline to be stretched out a little bit. And again, um, the author kind of took the best parts of what I liked about book one. And that's all this is, which is cool. Uh, I liked the thing. Uh, what I liked the most about book one was just the adventuring with his friends. Uh, going on quests, getting new gear, leveling up, grinding out experience points, skills, seeing how those skill trees branched out, what things they changed about the story and how they use them intelligently in fighting these mobs. Um, and that's mostly what this is. Um, again, 90% of the story is just in game with these characters. And I like that about it. Um, when it does go back to the real world, those stories aren't boring. And they're a nice break from some of the constant grinding that happens in the story. Um, and they're very interesting. Specifically, one one of my favorite parts of the story was when uh, the group gets together in real life with their spouses and their friends, and it's a big party. Um, uh, and it, it was just fun to see these characters outside of the game world still be as connected and friendly as they were in game. Sometimes that happens in real life and that a group of players that you have fun a fun time playing with in game can be friends in real life as well. And I was happy to see that these these guys um, were able to be friends in real life as well. And, and their spouses were interesting as well. But uh, one scene I really loved in particular was um, when one of the characters, partners, James, recounts how Jason, his partner, um, showed him how illogical it was for him to get jealous over Jason spending so much time in the game um, by making him think about essentially get mad and think about all the time he spends doing something, um, a solo activity like reading. And it just made me laugh because this is one of those things that you see in a lot of relationships in real life and with gamers and that one spouse is a gamer, one is not, and the other spouse just doesn't understand how that spouse could spend so much time doing this stupid thing uh, of gaming. And so unless they themselves become a gamer, it's really hard for them to um, understand why the person they love would rather spend time with this game instead of them. And that's kind of the viewpoint that's kind of reflected here in that this happens but the resolution of it was very interesting and very funny and i have to say i, I thought it was very enjoyable um and again most of the time is spent in um in this game in the novel with the main characters um going to adventures getting xp i loved it um however if you're expecting the big plot line of of of, of all kinds of mind control experiment or the government investigation to have any real advancement you're going to be disappointed um there is a tiny bit of advancement in that big plot, um, but not a lot. Again, most of it is just spent Alex, his friends, adventuring, uh, and a lot of details in there, of course. Um, but that's kind of it. So uh, if you're okay with that experience, you're going to have a good time with the story. If you're not okay with that experience, if you expect like this major epic plot line to be advanced quite significantly, um, that doesn't happen, unfortunately. Um, for me, I liked it just the way it is. I had a good time reading it. It gets a score of 7 out of 10 for me. Okay, on to uh, Ephilia, the soul of Aroga, a lit RP Denver adventure. It is written by N. Roberts. This one is 194 pages. It is $2.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, I will read you the author's description. Um, live for the game or die in it. Ephilia is the game world, uh, is the game the world has been waiting for. The game people said, it would change the way they lived, the game they thought they knew everything about. Jackson Mogg has been tasked with entering the virtual reality world and playing what he thought would be like every other simple MMORPG. Get in, do the quest, get out, defeat Auriga, and save the Empress seemed easy enough. But he wasn't prepared for just how different this game was going to be. With its futuristic technology and advanced AI systems, Ophelia was always set to be mind-blowing, but will completing the task really be enough to leave? What happens when immersive reality takes control of everything you thought you knew about the world slowly fades away? With a group of unlikely heroes by his side, he's about to find out. So there you go. Um, this is actually a really odd mixture of portal fiction and real-life sob story, um, and it's not really lit RPG, though. Um, I'd break the story into two main parts, when the main character is in the game and when he's in the real world. When the game character's main character is in the real world, it's really just a sob story on his behalf. His girlfriend and him are not getting along. She doesn't understand his dedication to game development, and she seeks he's spending too much time at work and not enough time with her, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they break up, and it's really supposed to be sad. And that part of it, it, it is kind of sad. 
if you're if you're empathetic toward the main player. Uh, but the actual all that real life story stuff disappears entirely by the fifty percent mark of the, of the novel, and you don't see it again until like the very, very very super end. I um, mean, even then, it's 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 not really that important to the story. Um, what this really becomes is the main character becoming trapped in the game, and he can't return until he finishes this word quest line. Um, but in the game, um, it never really feels like a game. The, the 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 fundamental premise of the story is that Jackson is supposed to be a, a VR game beta tester, and he's supposed to go in this game and test it out, and he just spends a lot of time there because he it's super immersive and it's fun. Um, except that there are really no game mechanics in the story. Uh, and it feels like portal fiction in, in that sense. Um, the extent of the game mechanics is a brief character creation scene at the very beginning where they're talking about classes and races. Um, and then there's a, literally two paragraphs about combat being um, simply timing your swing until the green exclamation point above the monster's head turns yellow and automatically hitting after that. Um, and yet even that aspect of it disappears entirely after those two paragraphs. You, like, you never see that game mechanic ever, ever again. And even in the story, um, the main character says he has to level that is super important that he gets experience to get more powerful, um, except that nothing ever comes about. Like in the entire story, I don't think the main character levels once. Like he never gains a level. He never gains any experience points for completing quests or killing monsters. Um, and even though it's supposed that even the main character says early on, that's stuff that's supposed to happen. Um, and so in that respect, it very much doesn't feel like lit RPG in any way, shape, or form. I actually counted. Um, there are six mentions of the word level in the game, and only once is it in terms of a game mechanic. Everything else is like he he stares levelly or the hill is level or you know things like that. Uh, and so that kind of gives you a reflection of exactly how m- much game mechanic is in the story, um, which is almost none. So um, while some of the backstory uh, uh, for some of his companions are interesting, the main character really just mostly wanders around. Things happen to him. The story itself is kind of bland. Um, there are literally no good cam- combat scenes. Um, and I, I mean, the combat is literally limited to most of us as I defeated a wolf. There you go. Um, and it, it's basically the tricked hero theme of the story where that the hero has a special quality. It's never said what it is. He's transported to a new world, tricked and unleashing an old evil that threatens not only his world, but this new one as well. And he must collect his companions and allies to defeat them. Only that actually doesn't happen in this particular novel. I mean, it doesn't end that way. He does the collecting. He goes to fight the evil, but then it just ends. That's it. There's not even a good ending in the story. It simply ends. Um, nothing's resolved. Um, so not only is this not a lit RPG, it's not really interesting. And so it gets a, a very poor score for me, a score of three out of 10. So there you go. Okay. Last one, folks, uh, healer's gift adventures of Brad, which is a really interesting title. Uh, book one adventures on Brad, which turns out is not the name of the main character. Rather, it's the name of the world, I believe. Okay. Um, it is 142 pages, $3.99. It is not available on Kindle Unlimited. Okay, I will read you the author's description. Uh, Daniel was gifted by the gods at birth, able to heal with a touch, even the most dangerous or grievous of wounds. Born in a mining camp, he's unable to stir, to still his restless heart and journeys to a nearby dungeon town to take his first steps as an adventurer. Following his journey, follow his journey rather, in a world full of monsters, dungeons, and a leveling system, a traditional fantasy story with lit RPG elements. Um, I actually disagree with that. I think it is full-on lit RPG, not a fantasy story with lit RPG. It's really, I, I enjoyed it. Um, it is a little pricey for the page count, um, but I thought it was an entertaining read. Um, and it's it's set up so that it's not, it's very easy to put down and pick up. Like you can read a chapter, go do something else, and come back to it, and you don't feel like you've lost anything. There's no, there's no sense of urgency in this story. It's almost a series of short adventures that happen with this main character. And that's that's okay. I mean, it's, it's you just have to be understanding that that's what it's going to be. There's no big evil plot to destroy the world. There's no sentient AI looking to destroy humanity. It's a simple story um, set in a fantasy world ruled by RPG mechanics. Um, 
main character again, Daniel, has a unique ability. He wants to become an adventurer. He goes dungeon diving. Um, and the dungeon knives are interspersed with things like regular social stuff, like going out on dates, um, healing in a clink, um, some nice backstory stuff, world building things. Um, we get interesting looks into social structures of the world, even between human and non-human races. Um, the main character makes friends. He he gets a dungeon diving partner, gains some skills, levels. It's simple. And I had a good time reading it. Um, I give it a score of 7 out of 10. So there you go. Enjoyable. 7 out of 10. And that's it. Done. Finished. There you go, folks. Uh, remember, you can follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and, of course, Patreon. If you want to help support the podcast in any way, shape, or form, you can do so at litrbdpodcast.com forward slash support. There you go. But, again, uh, thanks for hanging out with me this week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, until we can hang out again and talk about this thing that I love, Lit RPG, uh, remember to go read some Lit RPG. Goodbye, everybody.